The Imaginaries. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and launch us into this podcast with a quick question. If you were to be a dragon from the Harry Potter universe, which dragon would you be? I I'd probably, I would want to be probably Norbert specifically, because you know that Hagrid would take really good care of you. <laughs> it's like, pick who you, like, who, Yeah. Pick who's going to treat you nicely. Like, when I was growing up, it was, I don't just want to be a dog. I want to be my dog, right? <laughs> because, yes, a dog would be awesome, but I also know that my dog gets spoiled and things like that. So, yeah, I definitely pick Packers. That was Alyssa, a self-professed nerdy mechanical engineer with some social aptitude who suffers from curiosity and an addiction to puns. If you could be any character in any film, who would you want to be? Uh, like, if you could kind of embody, like, that fictional character's, like, life and adventure. Okay, but seriously, on the heels of Ghostbusters, you know I'm holding. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> you know that we're all yeah. Holtzman. <laughs> and this is me, Kendra. I'm a youth services librarian whose background is in creative nonfiction writing as well as incredibly non nonfiction y fanfiction, feminism, and the human spaceflight program. Not that I'm actually in the human spaceflight program, but one can dream. That's a good point. Well, that's why I tried to open it up because, like, there are other people too who. I would adventure as, but that's true. My, my, my immediate thought was um, Jodie Foster's character in Contact, mm. um, Ellie mm. who is, you know, one of the, <laughs> the most wonderful characters, I think, in the history of fiction for me, like both the book version and the movie version. But the fact that the movie basically revolves around her as this lone, persecuted voice that, that's like, hey, aliens exist, and I'm awesome, and I'm smart, and I'm going to look for them. And everyone else is like, no, you're dumb, and we want to do <laughs> other things. And she's like, no, fucking aliens exist. And then she's the first person who goes to meet them, and everything's really weird, and, you know, it's not exactly like close encounters of Star Trek or whatever, but you know, she's she's vindicated, she sticks to her guns, like I wouldn't necessarily want to be her, but that sort of validation that yeah. it has to be included in I devoted my life to this thing that people, that like basically everyone ever ridiculed me for, and yet I saw it through and was justified in pursuing it is really awesome and I applaud her for that. Tony is a writer in Tucson, Arizona, where we met several years back um, as mutual participants in the Master of Fine Arts Creative Writing Program at the University of Arizona. He is now getting a PhD in geography. Okay, I have to think about how to phrase this. If you could have had the teenage years of any teenagers from science fiction or fantasy video games whatever whatever you want to say um which which series of teenage years would you have had that's a terrible question but i hope you can sort of get no, it's a fun one i have to then think back to what are all the things that were specifically teen characters um that i've encountered in my life so <laughs> i agree i think it's tough to in a sense, time travel back to who we were when we were reading books about teens. I mean, there's still some well, pretty I, 
fantastic books in my memory that involve teens, but I'm not sure I would want to be those teens. Well, no, I guess I did watch teen shows. Because sometimes, though, I was still watching, like, adult content. Like, I wasn't, and I was reading adult books, and I was, um, or even, like, cartoons, like, all the superheroes, they're adults, <laughs> it's, except for, like, Teen Titans, which I didn't watch a whole lot of Teen Titans. And so the first thing that popped into my head was Harry Potter, of course, um, which I would not argue with being involved in that. Um, the other thing that popped into my head, I was trying to think back to other kid stuff that I watched in um, The Wild Thornberries. I don't oh know if you, yes. you watched The Wild Thornberries. Yes. But like that, that would be great. She talks to freaking animals and goes on these adventures and learns about the like biology of and, and the ecosystem and has dorky parents and her sister Debbie is hilarious. Like I feel like that would both be like that typical teen of like your family is weird and your parents are kind of goofy and so like ugh, family but at the same time like everybody has family members like all of them and an animal adventure so that one that one does pop into my mind and that one would be kind of fun the wild thornberries what a good choice yeah so I, i'd probably pick that one yes um random random aside so um god i just forgot uh lacy shaver I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong, um, but Lacey Shaver, who was the voice of Eliza Thornberry, is also the voice of um, Zatanna, who is a magical superhero in the series I just watched, Young Justice, and it's really awesome to hear, like, Eliza Thornberry's voice coming out of this, like, witch character, and it's really cool. Yeah, and you mentioned Young Justice is actually streaming on Netflix, correct? Yeah. It's in my queue. I just, you know, a lot of things are in my queue. A lot of things are in my queue as well. Story of my life. (laughs) Although I must note, actually, a great example of a new story involving kids that I'm in love with and wouldn't mind having their childhood, even though it'd be creepy as hell, um, is the new Netflix original Stranger Things which is set in the 80s and has this huge retro feel. Winona Ryder is totally freaking out every 30 seconds and uses Christmas lights to communicate with her potentially dead son. Um, And there's some sort of portal to another dimension and something rather like a hollow man figure um, or gingerbread man figure who comes out of the walls and attacks people. And it's, um, it's very like horror, retro horror chic with a great soundtrack um, and really weird um, storylines. But it's this group of kids who you start the series watching them play Dungeons and Dragons. I believe it's Dungeons and Dragons. I have never played Dungeons and Dragons. I should admit that at the outset. But they are playing playing tabletop role-playing games. And um, then they transition, of course, into losing one of their number in the woods at night you know it's that very stereotypical storyline but it's executed so well and i think because it's so minimal it relies on very minimal techniques to portray its Mm -hmm. horrors and of course as with most really good horror films the scariest thing is actually what we're capable of and not necessarily this bogeyman although he's pretty freaky too i was with some friends just two days ago and they were they were lauding that and being like, you have to watch this check it out it's on netflix go 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 and so I was like, okay just don't watch it late at night that's all i'm gonna say i have a couple episodes left because i, I don't know i couldn't marathon it through the night and you know finish it in the early morning hours and then go to bed and sleep at all no. You just mean because it's later, because it's scary. Because it's eerie. It's one of those okay. series that manages to evoke eeriness really, really well. So that would part be of me is like that means I must watch it at night. Ooh, at night. <laughs> while drunk, preferably while <laughs> drunk. What is a science fiction or fantasy book or movie that? you felt you were required to watch for whatever reason because Mm -hmm. social pressure because it's literary canon etc that you 
turned out to actively dislike? Okay, I have to go here and put myself on the chopping block and say um, Game of Thrones. <laughs> okay, explain that a little I, bit. Yeah. Um, the first season was already out, I think, on DVD. And so it was, but it was pretty early on. This was a few years ago. Four, three, four years ago. And everybody's into it. It's huge. And I like fantasy. So part of me was curious, and if everybody's liking it, I was like, I'll check it out. So I went over to a friend's house, and, well, I had tried the book, and I got 50 pages into the book, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get into the characters. I didn't like any of the characters. There was nothing that was redeeming enough or fascinating enough to hold my interest. But I was like, well, I can watch TV shows. That'll be a little faster, maybe a little more engaging. And so I went over to a friend's house, and I watched the first episode, and I was like, well, I'll give it one more episode, and that was it. I was done. I watched 50 pages and two episodes, and I can't do it. It does not catch my interest. I don't like the characters, and so I actually just get news from other people. So I'm aware of some of the things that happen, and I see all the social media so that I can stay informed without ever having to actually partake of and I think, but okay, so nothing. episode two, correct me if I'm wrong, but the episode where you stopped is the episode which involves the semi-rapish wedding with Cal Drogo and Khaleesi, right? And that, and yeah, that is it's worth noting as a turnoff a for bit. probably all of us. Yeah. And, and the, yeah, that, that really is, for me, the biggest turnoff for Game of Thrones. It's just so overtly sexual in an evil way or a predatory way and I just don't have the tolerance for that and I choose then to respect myself enough to avoid things that make me feel bad or things like that so this isn't to say that other people shouldn't be enjoying it or that Game of Thrones is terrible it was just an example of something where everybody else is is getting something from it that it just couldn't provide for me and so then I'm not going to force myself to try and fit the mold of, of something that I can't so uh so keep loving your game of thrones go all the way you know dragon queens I'm all for it um but it just wasn't for me and we will probably talk about game of thrones in the larger context of fantasy hitting the big and small screens at some point um Tony have you read or watched any Game of Thrones? I don't know if we've had this conversation. Yes. Yes. Right when Alyssa started to say that, I was like, oh, that's such a good answer. Um, <laughs> I actually, I made it a little further. I made it through um, the first book completely, and then like several chapters into the second book. And I want to say I watched the first four seasons of the show. So, like, you know, I was, I was pretty on board. But the thing that turned me off about the books was that the writing was just so gray. Mm. Like, there was no... It, it was basically, like... And it was basically, like, if you go into Wikipedia and you find a list of, I don't know, some... A ruling family of some country or polity in the past, like, and you look through the list of, like, who was alive when and who, you know, who succeeded whom under the throne and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, maybe you see a little bit about their lives and, like, what happened. That's what Game of Thrones felt like to me. Like, it felt like there was this really, really well-thought-out, complicated, creative world, but George R. R. Martin just did not have the storytelling chops to, like, take that amazing world and express it in a way that captivated me, at least. Like, I needed the writing to be doing a lot more um, than it was. And I made it through the first book just to see, like, you know, what is this? How is this? And then I just, I couldn't do it. I tried the second, and I'm like, this is just not my style of writing. This is not what I want to be reading. Um, the show, I actually, I <laughs> agree with everything you said. Um, I the reason I stuck with it for so long is that I think the show is actually really well put together. Like the the cast is really great. There's some really well written episodes. Like it's just gorgeous. Like the cinematography is wonderful. The directing is, is often like 
really, how, really how often do you get to um, see good CGI dragons on television? Right. Also a really good question. However, it just, I also had the same moment where I was like, this show is making me too uncomfortable in too many different ways. Like there's too much sexual violence. Mm. There's too much just, I'm like, predatory behavior is absolutely the right word for it. Mm -hmm. And the argument that I, I continue to hear, and I think this argument like is, <laughs> is for a lot of fantasies that are set in like, you know, vaguely medieval-ish um, time periods is that like, well, there's like some aspect of realism there. Like they're treating, they're treating women the way women would have been treated. And, yeah, but it's fantasy. You know, we have the opportunity like, to so... at least comment on that or address right, it. Right, exactly. And there's, you're, you're, you're in a land where there are motherfucking dragons. Like, motherfucking dragons! Women treat, we're not treated in, in any way at that point. You could do literally anything you want. Like, you can reinvent gender politics. Like, it's so it's so lazy, I think, to sort of, like, go back to that and, so like, lazy. rely on the male gaze and the predatory gaze and the sexual objectification of women and sexual violence against women. And, and it just, it could have done so much more. And they brought it on so many different fronts for that show that, like, the fact that they were not bringing it more on that front and it was making me feel so uncomfortable finally turned me off. And I was like, I, I can't watch the show anymore because I don't want these images in my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what it was for me. So, Tony, would that be your answer for the question as well? Um, I, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think it, I think it's definitely a good answer. I could, I could probably give a lot of things for this. Generally, I would say the, the broad category of science fiction that I don't really get, um, are, are the things like, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably going to like misuse terms and all kinds of stuff all throughout the podcast, so <laughs> don't quote me, is that the only thing I'm saying I quote, so quote sure me, I guess. Um, but like, I think of it as like golden age, things like, you know, Robert Heinlein, uh, whose name I can never pronounce, but like Asimov, like mm. Frank Herbert Dune, like, you know, those sort of like very mainstream, here's sci-fi, like white guys writing about white guys doing things in space kind of stuff, sci-fi. <laughs> Um, and a lot of it is just so, not even necessarily the chosen one arc, but like the, you know, the hero who goes and does things. And I never, I find it really hard to get into those old novels for that reason, even though I'm like, you know, think of these as apart from when you're reading them and think about them, you know, when they were being published, like it was something fairly new to like put these, put these circumstances together in these settings and like follow them which which is true but i just have a hard time reading like that so things like i tried to reread dune recently and i got about 200 pages in and i was just like i can't i don't i don't, I don't care <laughs> this it's, is i think dune is a great example because i did not enjoy the book but i weirdly sometimes get a craving to watch the television miniseries for some reason and I think it's entirely yeah, because there haven't been a lot of groundbreaking science fiction television shows, um, but that was yeah. one of them. And so it may not even be that I like Dune, the television series. It might entirely right. be that I like seeing science fiction on television, and for a long time there wasn't. And so that became yeah. one of the few go-tos that I could use. But the the white dudes writing about white dudes that is just the legacy of all genres in so many ways oh oh oh, oh. i just as soon as you said that back okay here's my actual 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 answer okay um star tide rising which i think is the title if i fuck it up sorry um, but it's by david brin and it's the first book in his uplift series and I think uplift as a concept is so interesting and so important. And I've seen so many other works like drawing from that. And the basic idea is like you have you have alien species that like instead of going with the Star Trek ideal of like we don't screw around with civilizations that have not yet moved to the stars, it's like the complete opposite. 
they go in and they like you know teach younger species and help them become star pairing and like i just thought that was so cool like when i found out about it years and years and years ago and i tried to read that book and it was just i could not get through it because it was so objectifying towards like every female character it was so like the main character was so obviously an author insert and he wanted to be like the hero of the story and like every description of him from like every other character all you hear about is how good looking he is and how intelligent he is and how he knows how to solve everything and how everyone <laughs> just, like i swear to god this is like all like a paraphrase but almost a direct quote like how one of the two recurring female characters is just like feels so randy around him or something and i was just like no this is not <laughs> this is not real and important so yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic I feel like we're all on the same page in terms of gender representation being a really important uh, feature of good science fiction. Um, and, 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 100%, that, yeah. and that science fiction presents us with so many opportunities to explore alternate narratives of gender representation. And so when it fails, it almost feels like more of a betrayal because we, we have this expectation that science fiction can do more than say, um, a Western, a book in the Western genre or something like that. You know, there's only so many, uh, broad shouldered and narrow hipped gunslingers, um, that I can handle. Right. 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 Especially, and I guess this is actually something I'd like to talk about at some point and we can return to this, but like the idea of the canon, like, even though, you know, science fiction is sort of like, you know, seen as like lower and this is another thing we can talk about but like how things like um foundation which i actually do like but like dune and star trek rising and like um uh i don't know those i'm like totally blanking on names but how those have become like the thing that people remember from those times even though there were like lots of women writing great science fiction mm, there was mm-hmm. lots of like countercultural science fiction like there are all these things that did exist and do exist but they're just like not part of the canon like you don't hear about them even though they were contemporaries and like were out there at the same time but um i don't know that's frustrating we well, should not... yeah and i know i'll probably mention this in the future as well but uh, just one thing that's kind of been getting to me more and more in the recent years is how with a lot of these stories the ones that uh but books are a little bit different um and comics i think but especially the like television and movies media where there is a lot of business involved that overlaps what stories get to be told and what kinds of characters we can have and i uh, am excited at some point to talk about ghostbusters but you know you've got queer representation and things and star wars with um with ray Stormtrooper, like and it's, finn yeah, well, and yeah, you've got, oh, yeah, you've got POC, you've got people of color, and you've got female protagonists, and just people weren't really into that, but you have to choose as, as a, Some people a media were not provider really into to that. do that, and it can be hard to get um, approval from the bosses, being, you know, the Hollywood moguls and the people who are funding these things, and um, I think that there's a demand for it, but you, you're not necessarily going to reach you know, a billion dollars all the time on that. Star Wars is one of the few. Ghostbusters only made about forty-six million, but that's a big, that's a big deal. So it did far. really well, and and, and, and so I, I think that the people are more ready. Someone to, put those okay. um, statistics into context. Where forty-six million dollars was like the third largest comedy opening of the summer. It was yeah. the largest opening for all of the main cast. The only exception was Chris Hemsworth, but it was his largest accepting MCU ever. So this has been a really good weekend yeah. for comedy, even if it hasn't been a big weekend for science fiction. It broke it broke barriers and broke um, figure sales figures for comedy. Um, on the big screen. Oh, yeah. So I think in context, mm-hmm. Ghostbusters did really, really well. And I think it has earned back um, most of its original um, cost. So it did pretty well. Yeah. Um, and, and so we don't need to oh, despair. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is changing the conversation. 
and like Bernie Sanders, you know, sometimes that's a really important thing to do. Just to just put something alternate out there and maybe it's not the biggest film of the year, but maybe the only way to be the biggest film of the year is to pander and do exactly what every other film is doing that summer. And, you know, we don't we don't necessarily uphold narratives that are catering to popular taste. Some of them are great. <laughs> but Right. Like Jurassic World and it being a dumpster fire. Oh my but, goodness. You know, um, you know, Oh, what a trash can and trash fire in a trash can of a movie. But we'll get to Jurassic World at some point in the future because, believe me, I think we all have a bone to pick <laughs> with Jurassic World messing with our childhoods, if anything, did. I don't know. I started to give up a little bit on the, like, messing with our childhood idea. I need to think more into that as, as a term and an idea. Personally, um, especially uh, Ghostbusters is what's bringing that uh, terminology, me questioning my personal usage of saying ruining my childhood. But I haven't thought too much into that. That's a whole other yeah. conversation. Now it has the connotation what? of internet trolls, specifically male internet trolls, which probably didn't exist before Ghostbusters. You know, I agree that, that yeah. Ghostbusters has changed what yeah. that phrase connotes, even if it doesn't change what it literally mean but i'm a fan of, of, of jurassic park and the lost world i do like the second one a lot um <laughs> and actually this provides a perfect segue uh, towards talking briefly about what we want to discuss later in the podcast as the months roll around our first scheduled uh podcast is going to be about the alien series um using that as a platform to discuss uh, sequels, prequels, reboots in the near future. Yeah. What else yes. would you guys like to discuss on the Imaginaries? Oh, everything. Everything. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, let's um, start with you, Alyssa. Um, what is your number one, like, fan love? The thing that you love, and I'm not allowing you to say Ghostbusters because that's still too new and too fresh, and yeah. we're going to discuss it anyway. Yeah. One, that's really hard. Um, okay, three. I'll have to get back to you if I, if I can think of like one that's really standing out to me. But I will say that one thing that I do enjoy, and I, I, I think I'll be the main person bringing this aspect into our conversation, but um, is, is video games. And the role that video games have played in my life, and I've been playing them since I was a kid, um, starting all the way back with, like, uh, the Highlights magazine had a computer game, so I was yeah. playing that kind of point-and-click stuff, To Like, I was playing Doom. My mother did not know that. She only recently <laughs> found out and was like, I did not know that. I was like, I know, you probably would have stopped me from playing that. <laughs> it's a little bit violent. Um, but, uh, I, and so there are, I play a lot of sci-fi, um, or at least kind of futuristic video games. Uh, so, like, Mass Effect is my biggest video game it was the best experience i've had all around it kind of felt like watching a movie where i get to pick what happens so i don't know that's not really answering your question but uh from that spec i have a specter tattoo i just got framed three uh posters that i have bought at various comic cons um that are going to go in my bedroom i haven't gotten them hung yet but they're framed one might be three feet by five feet you know so it's cute um, I, I love Mass Effect. I have all kinds of things from it. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's one that has really stood out to me. So, I don't know. I'd like to, I'll, I'll bring in maybe some video game aspects. Maybe which, just a genre, not, not a story, but... Which I should note, this afternoon, um, as part of my uh, position as youth services librarian, every Friday afternoon, we either watch a movie in the library or we play games in the library and we do have a Wii and um, there was Just Dance. I failed miserably at Just Dance, but we also have Mario Kart. <laughs> Mario Kart for the Wii. And um, I nosedived into a wall and then drove sideways, still nose into the wall the entire course of the game. So Alyssa has tried previously to introduce me to various video games and um, it always turns out better when I just watch her play the video game. I enjoy that much no. more. Although you picked up very quickly on uh, Disney's Fantasia Evolved, the <laughs> game. Yes, yes, I love that game. 
no shame. I conduct whatever I can. And uh, so that game was right up my alley. I love it. It's very, very fun. And you seem to have fun with it, even though you're not the I, I will, video game. Group. I will not lie. It was enjoyable um, in a way that... Lara Croft Tomb Raider was inaccessible to me that was accessible to a beginner. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, my experience with video games is mostly as an observer of other people who are far more talented. So I'm very excited that we're going to get some of that narrative. You may definitely beta test or otherwise force me to play video games in order to um, discuss them with you. Um, but it should be noted that I will probably never survive the first level of whatever game it is that you're discussing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Tony, how about you? What would you like to see? Yes, yes, yes. Anyway? All right. So I'm gonna. I, I I thought of a bunch of things, but I'm gonna go through um, a few. So picking up the video game thread, um, I am a Nintendo fan, and I have been since the late '90s. We actually the first video game system my family had was an N64. Ooh. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I was like, you know. I forget how old, like 11 or 12 when we got it. So I did not really grow up with video games, at least not the beginning. But um, I really want to talk about the Zelda and the Pokemon franchises, which I have followed since then. Our first game was Zelda Ocarina of Time. Um, so that the Zelda series in particular is very near and dear to me. Um, the other video game I want to talk about is called um, Star Control 2, The Earth One Masters, which is which was a computer game in the 90s and has had this very small but very dedicated fan community since. Um, and the company that... Oh, I'm going to screw this up. I really need to do, like, homework before I talk about these things, apparently. But <laughs> as far as I remember it, the company that owned the source code, like... Um, let it go for free because it had been so many years or something, 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 and then fans actually, like, put together and have continued to put together working versions of the game with things like um, a redone soundtrack and a HD um, overhaul of the graphics, and there actually is a new game in the franchise coming out after, like, 20 years or something because a, um, a fan of the game who now has his own company... I, I believe he really liked the game, but like bought the trademark to the name and the stuff and stuff and stuff. Anyway, Star Control 2, I really want to talk about that and the Star Control franchise. Other things I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> specifically, again, going back to something I've been a fan of since I was a kid, and actually right around the same time as when I picked up Zelda for the first time, but the Animorphs book series yes. is, you know, something that's very 90s. I'm, you know, very much of a time, but it's it was and has been so influential for me as someone who, like, you know, was coming to terms with what stories can I tell, what, you know, how do I dress up those stories, what are the allegorical potential, what is the allegorical potential for science fiction in a way that isn't, like, super blatant, like Star Trek, but for kids, so it has to be blatant, but not really. Um, and I just think, even now, like, going back and looking at them, like, Animorphs is so smart, and what K.A. Ka Applegate as an author did is also so smart, like, the way she basically, without leaving out any of the emotional heft, like, basically wrote for children about war forever and ever <laughs> through first-person narrative in a way that, like, made it the number one selling, you know, book series in the U.S. for many, many years. So I definitely want to talk about that. And the third thing, since you limited me to three, the third thing that I really <laughs> want to talk about is, and I know we have a show coming up where we will talk about this, but the line between science fiction and fantasy and whatever else, like genre fiction and like serious literature, serious literary fiction, because it really bothers me that it's a, that there's a line at all, but, but I, I see it repeated so often and even sort of like off the cuff, like, low literature versus, like, <laughs> high literature. And I think that's just bullshit because, um, you know, we can go into we can go into different definitions, and this is one that I will do plenty of homework for. But, like, for example, one of my favorite books, which is not defined as science fictional, 
is um, a visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer E G A N. I don't know how to pronounce Egan. that name. Egan. 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 Thank you. But I I love that book in part because it basically takes its narrative via a whole bunch of different characters from the seventies up through some unspecified point in the future, maybe twenty, maybe thirty years. But she's done so much thinking um, about how those future sections are written and how people are living in the future and, you know, future technology and how they're communicating. And um, and I just think it's so cool and so well thought out and so science fictional in a way that I define as science fiction that I'd like to get into that and, like, talk about, you know, at least for us and for, like, what we see, what is that line? And I don't want to, like, give the leading question, like, should there even be a line? Because there shouldn't be. But I'm also not naive enough to say, oh, we should just do away with all lines forever because I understand books are marketed and publishers have to make money and yada, 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 which is its own discussion for sure. But anyway, that's those are some things that I want to talk about. Fantastic. It's going to be a great lineup. I'm really excited about it. We are coming to the end of our time today, so... Okay, I'm just going to say it. We're all queer. And I want to discuss queer science fiction and or the queering of science fiction and or representation um, of the queer folk um, amongst the various science fiction universes. Um, And and I think it's it's the elephant in the room for a lot of us, um, how different voices um, are or are not silenced in the narratives that we love. And um, Alyssa and I have discussed in the past how especially lesbians are killed always, pretty much always, in science fiction and other genres. But you see a lesbian on screen and you automatically are fearful for her life. Um, You know, whether it's in the next episode or the next season, usually... um, there is this tendency to kill off said character in order to further someone else's character development or and or you know um, plot. So I want to discuss the queer in science fiction. I am of course asexual, um, and so finding an asexual on screen is even harder. There are a lot of people who you could read as asexual, um, but usually those characters right. are only desexualized. Um, until their sexuality is useful for a plot at some point. And I would say that that um, is accurate for a lot of sidekick characters in science fiction. They're just kind of like neutral territory until suddenly someone needs the plot to move somewhere and then their sexuality becomes an issue. So I would like to discuss queerness and the queer and the queering of science fiction. So that's my number one. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And there are, of course, a couple different series that we could talk about, a bunch of books as well. Um, and things are opening up there, so there's hope. But it's still like a, a minefield for for the queer community. Can I? Yes. Can I interject for one minute? I would just, I'll kind of add to that, because, like, the, the lesbians always die in the bury your gaze trope. Um, yes. I'll just kind of throw in there, like, we could even, for the, like, future conversations, I don't know if we'll want to do a specific episode, or we'll just hit the hit them as they come, but tropes. tropes. There are a lot of other tropes out there. Because even, like, the killing off a character for, for something else, like, women in refrigerators trope, like, oh. we've got a bunch of stuff, so I'm, I'm going to throw in tropes, mm-hmm. um, yeah. all of them, in general, in there. Well, we'll get to those, but yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, another one which is uh, perhaps a little bit, lighter of a topic I want to discuss is film this the scoring of science fiction the music of science fiction film specifically because I um, started my evening tonight with listening to the Martian soundtrack which um, I know I love the Martian film and I love the Martian book Tony you found it a little bit less easy to access Alyssa, we haven't talked about it in great detail, but I know you've seen it too. Um, So the soundtracks to the films that we love and um, perhaps the soundtracks to films we don't love, what role does music play in how we receive the worlds that are given to us on the screen? And, um, you know, I, I I just love the music and I can't 
watch a film, whether it's the Ghostbusters film that's in theaters now, or the upcoming Star Trek film, um, or the, of course, the great uh, collection of John Williams scores for Star Wars. Um, you know, I just can't not be informed by the music, really, in a deep emotional level. So that's my number two. And my third would be, um, quote unquote, hard science fiction versus quote unquote so soft science fiction. <laughs> you know, what favors are we doing to soft and hard science fiction, air quotes implied, um, by using these terms? Is there such a thing as hard science fiction? And, um, you know, what does it bring to the table um, that we can use as writers, as readers, as game players moving forward? So those are my three. Queer, yeah. musical, hard science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I agree. Because, um, yeah, yeah, music is very important. Music is so important. Yeah, well. Music is so important. And the science uh -huh. in science fiction is also very important. Um, mm -hmm. And the characterization. So those would kind of be the general categories under which my points fall. Um, yeah, as a, as a person who builds worlds myself occasionally, um, these things are important to me personally. So, um, that brings us to, um, actually well after our original scheduled time frame for this particular podcast. Um, we hope that you have found it informative, at least to our quirks and our tastes. <laughs> Um, if nothing else, you know how weird we're going to be for the next few months. So congratulations for if you've stuck with us this far. And look forward in the next couple of weeks to podcasts about the Alien series of films and Star Trek. And we'll start throwing in some comics, video games, and book series in the weeks to come. Yes. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. This is gonna be this is gonna be re really cool to be able to, you know, um, have a conversation about these things in a way that hopefully isn't just our conversation to have, but actually opens up conversations um, and you know lets us take part in conversations that are already happening and that have been happening and that are are important because they're happening and. I don't know. Conversations, yay! <laughs> Conversations, yay! <laughs> One final thought to head you out of the podcast. Triggering geography brain. Like, I actually think it's really cool that we're then all of us are sort of like, you know, we're not in California or Portland or Seattle, and we're not on, like, you know, the East Coast. We're not in New York, and we're not in New Jersey. Like, we're sort of like, you know... In the middle of nowhere. Right, right. <laughs> but we're like, you know, we're also people who, who have opinions and like talking about things, and it's like, this is sort of... Just the fact that we're us talking about these things is sort of countercultural, because we, you know, have chosen to live in, like, very different places from the people who, like tend to make the decisions about like what is okay for media and like who listens to what and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there, there is a sense of self-determinism to science fiction that is written by people who live in London, New York, um, LA. Occasionally you have yeah. people from San Francisco and Seattle and Portland and the West coast there. And you might have a couple from Florida, but like in the U S there really isn't a lot of um, flyover country, quote unquote, science fiction that's reached the mainstream um, and so you do tend to see a um, misrepresentation or underrepresentation of those again quote unquote flyover country um, areas Thank you for joining us for our first ever podcast. We hope to improve, of course, over the coming weeks and months, including our quality of audio, our website, which you can find at www.imaginaries.us, 
and in our interlinkage with social media platforms. But for now, you can find us on SoundCloud and the iTunes Store. And very soon, we will be branching out into Spotify.